So um, I'm Janine Epic from the Jackson Laboratory, and I'm going to do sort of two things here. One is I'm going to tell you a bit about MGI and the data content uh, to, to start with as an introduction, and then I'm going to talk specifically about the triage process and try to explain it in a little bit more detail, um, both the process itself and kind of the, uh, the outcomes that we would like to have from working with the uh, getting an NLP process in place to um, help us with triage. Okay, so MGI uh, serves actually three different user communities. Um, so in a way, um, we're a little bit schizophrenic in that way. So we have biological researchers who are the wet bench researchers who are investigating the underpinnings of biological processes um, in a very detailed way uh, and really getting at some of the mechanisms. We have clinical researchers who are actually using mouse as a model to study human disease and human biology. And we have computational biologists and informaticians who leverage our data to do lots of interesting um, things. So, the, so MGI represents and integrates a lot of different kinds of biological data, which are represented on this slide. Um, the genome features that are, are based on the mouse genome assembly, um, various kinds of maps, um, both uh, genetic and genomic maps, embryonic gene expression patterns, um, gene function, which is um, instantiated as Go, um, comparative genomics, uh, we cover, we include both um, mammalian um, orthologs and homologs, as well as we've just recently added zebrafish and chicken. Um, phenotypes of uh, mutations that have, have occurred in the mouse, of which there are thousands, hundreds of thousands. And then disease models. Um, so we associate specific mouse genotypes to the human diseases for which they uh, have been used as experimental models. And all of this data, which we uh, spend a lot of time integrating, and that's actually probably what we spend most of our time doing is integrating data, really enables data mining and allows you to uh, span the whole gamut of different kinds of information that is included. So just some of the quick facts. So MGI is a freely available database. It's an international resource for the genetic, genomic, and biological data for mouse. It's a gold standard for a lot of mouse reference data sets, including genes, Go, phenotypes, and mouse human disease associations. We're an integrator of mouse data sets and provide expert curation and using defined vocabularies and ontologies. And we're the authoritative source for mouse nomenclature. Okay, so what can you find? This kind of repeats a little bit of what I said in the first slide in a little more detail. So uh, genomic features, maps, nucleotide and protein sequences associated to those genome features. Go annotations, homologies, gene expression, SNPs and variants, um, catalog of mutant alleles and QTLs, phenotype data, mouse genotypes to human disease associations, vocabularies, and links to lots and lots of other relevant resources. Okay, so the integration part, as I said, is, is something that we spend a lot of time doing because data comes from lots of different sources and in lots of different forms. And one of the, of course, first things we need to do is identify the objects that are equivalent in those in different data sets and different databases. So that um, actually is done in both manual and automated ways, which in the end re results in both incorporate, automatic incorporation of data, but also in a lot of quality control reports that then end up on a curator's desk for resolution. And finally, those um, various data sets are assembled with all of the connections that we can now f 
form because we've standardized and uh, to ontologies and vocabularies, the various uh, data, and also identified all the object equivalents so that in the end, you get a much more composite picture and, all, and new data connections that you didn't have before. So this really supports robust data analysis and supports hypothesis generation for uh, users. So again, getting back to our data sources, if you just go by qual quantity, of course, most of the data comes from big data, data loads like GenBank and, and SNPs data. Um, other big data sets come from ANU mutagenesis centers and other centers that are, are generating lots of data. But actually, a lot of the very detailed data comes from either the electronic submissions from individual labs or the primary literature, because that's where the actual details um, reside. So the problem, which of course we're talking about today, is because there's this huge um, proportional value in, in these specific focus studies that you get from the literature, it's really important to in integrate that data. So the initial steps that is finding the appropriate publications and then classifying them for curation and prioritization is very time consuming. It's not the best use of our expert biological staff, but it, it absolutely has to be done. So there's a really a pressing need to address literature acquisition and classification. And it would be a tremendous cost benefit to MGI and lots of other groups who, who do publication-based annotation. So where we're at right now is this graph just shows you the growth of our, the reference data in MGI. Currently, or as of last week anyway, there are 193,524 publications in MGI. That's a lot of publications. So in order to regularly get this, and we, we um, enter approximately 11 to 12,000 new publications each year through our curation effort. So about 150 journals are scanned regularly, and they are basically we have about 20 curators who are who do triage our literature triage, and they are each have certain sets of journals assigned to them for which they are responsible for for scanning those and identifying which are appropriate for including in MGI. And which journals are on this list of 150 journals is determined every year we go back and evaluate how many articles those journals are um, providing into the database. And uh, there's slight adjustments made from year to year, but it's not hugely significant. So the identification and triage of new publications is semi-automated, automated, and I'll show you some, a bit about the tools we're using right now. But we really would like to get this fully automated. This is, this is a big time sink that we would really like to um, get rid of for our uh, staff. OK, so here's a little bit more detail about what happens in this literature triage process. So the first thing is identifying potentially MGI relevant publications from all the publications. As I said, there's about 150 journals that we're using. One of the challenge is that you can't use abstracts to identify the publications that we need because, at least for mouse, very frequently the organism is not mentioned in the abstract. And that's partly because mouse and human are used sort of as the main mammalian uh, representatives, shall I say, in, in, in the literature. And so nobody feels, I guess, ne necessary to distinguish that in the abstract. I, anyway, so there's a very small percentage that can actually be pulled out just using abstracts. So that's a problem. 
the other challenge is, of course, then that means we have to search the full text for mouse, murine, or mice, and then determine the context because we don't want to pick out articles that are just using a mouse antibody, for instance, or that are just using mouse embryonic fibroblast cells. Those really aren't what we're after. So it's both identifying the species. The species of the study is, is not as easy as one might think to identify. So the second uh, step in, in this primary triage is having, having done that first step and identifying things that are potentially mouse, murine, or mice that are of interest, then we need to determine what kind of data is in there of all of those sorts of data that MGI regularly integrates, what sort of data. So does it have mutants? Does it have gene expression data? Does it have functional data? Does it have cancer data? Um, or is it describing some new gene or new allele or new QTL that isn't, isn't already in MGI? So after the initial, yes, this is a potential paper that is needed, then we have to, then the curator needs to take a quick scan of the contents again for what kind of information is actually in the paper. So this, at this point, um, the uh, PDF files that are relevant are given a file name by their PDF ID and some appended indication of the data content um, and then it's stored in a specific directory uh, in the computer. Okay, and then there's another, sec what we call secondary triage. And this is where the content areas are reviewed by additional curators. And so the first task of trying to identify the papers and give a quick look of what's there is the quick look. So, so then, there's a second round where other curators will look at the ones, only the ones that are chosen and say, oh, you missed that, there's gene expression in this paper. So they tag it additionally. And at that point, the full reference, and the full reference then gets uh, downloaded from, from PubMed for you know, journal author title and abstract. And then the, we have an, uh, then our admin staff will put the tags on those records as to what areas that paper is relevant for. And a third step to this is actually indexing the publications to the genome features that are described. And that um, is done, well, for, for a couple of reasons. But one reason is that even then, pre-full curation, users will have access to that paper if they search for a, for a gene or um, a mutation that is contained in it. So it's sort of a pre-curation um, step. So in this case, the challenge to us is that very few journals actually have authors use standardized nomenclature. Very few of them require that as a step. Some of them do, which we, we like that, but it's very, very low frequency. So then another, so another step is for uh, curators to, in some cases, hunt down what the real object or gene is actually being talked about in the paper. So the payoff for users is the ability to find the relevant publications for the gene of interest or the mutant of interest, despite the misnaming that happens in uh, the publication. Okay, so what if we, our ideal would be that this entire process that I just described was done automatically. That's the ideal, but it will take a while to get there, I'm sure. In the meantime, we've been trying to use some electronic tools to help aid in in doing this process. So we use QOSA as an access to journal PDF files 
and ProMiner to help us in indexing the literature with the appropriate genes. Um, we've just recently gotten uh, Elsevier Journal's um, XML access. And of course, we've been working with Gully to build the, building the Sinomine infrastructure, which we hope will um, go a long ways towards this automatic process. So um, we would like to ultimately move all of this literature acquisition, like I said, to be automatic and actually managed by the JAX li library services if possible. But I know that that's probably still several years off, but that's, that, that would be great. Um, so here's what uh, CLOSA looks like. This is um, a scientific literature management software and basically, we can access PDF files using this tool. You still need to, um, you, can, you can search the journal articles using this for mouse, my, mouse, mouse and murine, but you still need to pull up the PDFs and, and look at them. Um, okay, so this just shows another shot of close where the mouse, mouse mice and murine are, have been highlighted in, in the text so that you can uh, quickly check it out. This is just a shot from ProMiner, which is used for indexing genes. And this is just shows you some examples of what kind of things you actually see when I said that the nomenclature adherence in journals is very bad. So at the, at the top is a paragraph which shows you um, one of them, SHH, which is Sonic Hedgehog, is actually correctly um, provided here, but the others are not. And down below, um, we have two different um, targeted mutations that uh, are incorrectly shown. So this is kind of typical of, of the standard nomenclature that you see in, in scientific articles in many, many um, journals. Okay, so what we need is a functional and practical tool that will help us in identifying publications that have mouse, murine, and mice as the experimental organism to identify the er content areas of relevant publication, so functional information, expression information, mutants, variants, phenotypes, disease models, and tools to aid in, in selecting the publication, the, to indexing the publications to the genes and mutant alleles that are described in them using standard nomenclature. That's a big order there. And we do have over 193,000 articles that can be used as a test set. So that part um, we offer to you. Okay, so as um, Gully has described already, our, our frustration really is that for um, all the NLP things that have been out there and that we've participated in, so we've provided data files to many of these NLP um, contests, shall we say. Um, but these have all been exercise, NLP exercises to test their algorithms. It's, there's nothing on the other end for us to help us um, actually get this literature and data curation done. So there's no useful application tools. So Sino, the Sinomine approach really starts bringing this into a practical application that we can use, which is really, uh, will be fantastic if it works. And um, I encourage you all to, to help out with this project because it's not just us. I mean, MGI is a big project and we have lots of literature, but there are lots of other database projects out there that would love this as well because this is a big block for all of us. And I think that's all I really um, want to say. And is there any questions?
um, of the consistency of the human annotators. There's a lot of text to look through. How often does one annotator, uh, one curator miss something that another one would have labeled? How, how subjective is it? Are they pretty much always on the same page or are there legitimate disagreements about what should be labeled, that kind of thing? Um, okay, so one of the reasons that that second step of the, of the additional curator looking at the paper is, is mostly to, to make sure nothing has been missed. But um, we have extensive documentation for uh, if, I am, if I am a curator and I'm working on Go, say, I have extensive documentation of when I should pick something for a disease annotation or when I should pick something for um, gene expression. There's, you know, we, we, we take this, we don't take this. There's, there's, there's sort of those rules out there. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't say that it's perfect, but um, we tend, they all, the curators also tend to be more generous. That is, they, they, they will overpick rather than underpick. Hmm. And so if a curator um, goes to pick up a paper that's, that's tagged, say, for gene expression, they may, they may not have, it may not have been a, somebody that works on gene expression that's actually tagged it. But if they go to look at it and it's not, we will untag it basically. Gotcha. So, but but it's ten, the tendency is to be overpick rather than underpick. Great, thank you. Harold Harold needs to say something because he's one of the curators. <laughs> it's been my experience, and I think some other Go curators will uh, at MGI will agree that the number of false positives that we see are, um, I'd say, remarkably low considering um, what it could be. Of course, the, the major problem is that if something isn't tagged for Go, and, you know, and this means that in order to be at that stage, one of the Go curators had to have missed it because we have the secondary triage. Of course, that's, that's unfortunate then that we won't see that paper. Um, it might be tagged for something else, but in our active curation process, we won't see that on our list. And I don't know what percentage that is. Um, it's kind of un unknown at this point. We, we kind of trust each other because we all have gone through extensive training on uh, not only what, for example, a Go curator would pick for Go, but we also have been trained in, well, if you see this paper, an alleles person would want this because X, Y, and Z. So we kind of trust each other. Um, three questions. Um, how many curators do you have? Um, how many curators or how many curators that do triage? <laughs> <laughs> There's about uh, 20 curators that do triage. There's about 26 maybe total. 26 to do curation? Okay. Do curation. It's because you create 60 papers per workday roughly, if you do 1,200 per year? Okay. Um, you have the pro minor system, so you have already have the genes highlighted in those PDFs. They're highlighted and then, as I said, the, they're highlighted, but the, um, the person who is doing the indexing goes through that with the highlighted text because, uh, as I showed you, the nomenclature is not necessarily correct. So it may be a completely different um, gene than what is highlighted. So, okay, because the ProMiner people claim that ProMiner was evaluated in the biocreative evaluations and they claim it's 80% correct. So mm, you might not agree with that. The, their annotations are 80% correct. That's, that's what they claim. Judy would like to make a comment. <laughs> I was actually just looking at the MGI homepage, and it occurred to me that one thing you might want to add to your FAQ is, as an author, how can I make it easier to get my paper into MGI? <laughs> <laughs> yes. We, th there is actually, if you look in the navigation bar, Something that says submit data on that. <laughs> yeah. uh, I just want to make yeah. a couple comments. One is that, um, in general, the curators spend maybe 10% of their time on this task. This is not their prime, you know, this is a, 
a measure of one of their tasks. Um, yeah. And uh, for example, um, we may miss some, but there's other methodologies for bringing papers in. And what we're really hoping is that we can get good um, precision recall measures that would allow us to drop triage to the point of being able to serve up um, a significant um, set of papers for this event. Each of the subgroups yeah. within MGI has different thoughts on this from the gene ontology perspective. Um, we have a variety of ways of identifying sets of, of experimental data that are most important for us, and so we are not um, okay. perhaps as concerned about giving every experimental paper because at the moment, for example, we have 60,000 papers that we have identified for Go curation that we have not curated. So um, yes, we want that pathway to be robust, but we also need to um, improve um, our ability to, um, to bring the knowledge into the database that's presented in the paper. And for example, in Janan's, so I'm, I do comparative functional genomics. Janan is primarily responsible with phenotypes and mouse models, and they do a pre, she might want to mention this, pre-indexing as to the mouse models before they're actually mm -hmm. annotated to MP, to the mammalian phenotype ontology. So there's many, many other steps beyond the triage tasks that were that's being identified here. Um, yeah. Do you have, sorry. That's what I was gonna say about So. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm representative of BioCreative here. So one thing that you should consider is in the different BioCreatives, there is a scope to the, each of these tasks. So the very first time they did the gene normalization, gene mention, and a couple of first times, um, what happens is you have a scope by organism. So you already knew that all the papers are about human or about mouse or whatever, and that makes the task much easier. The very last BioCreative uh, where we ran a gene normalization task was on full text and in unlimited species, so we didn't tell what species it was, and the, accurate, the um, uh, precision was dropping very drastically. Uh, you know it is a mouse paper, but not all the genes in the paper must be mouse, right? Yeah. So the markup for the nomenclature is very good with ProMiner? And, and the issue, because, primarily because, well, many reasons, but one of the main reasons is that because we have, between mouse, rat, and human, we have extensive synonymy lists, and therefore we can post. So what, uh, what is fed forward to the indexer is the ProMiner case of entity recognition, and then we select which ones are the primary genes for the paper and what their official nomenclature is. So again, and I'm very much a supporter of what I call semi-automated processing. We try to get the NLP stuff to drive as much forward as we can, and then we bring in the expert um, to make the final selection. Yeah. 